Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your speakers in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. I will now turn the conference over to Chris Hunt. Sir, you may begin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning or perhaps even good evening. I see some folks from around the world on the webinar today. And, and welcome to the uh, monthly Team Steps webinar for the month of July. This is the introduction to the fundamentals of Team Steps concepts and tools. Uh, and this is really part one of three webinars. So today we're going to focus in on the fundamentals of Team Steps. Next webinar, next month in August, we're going to talk about creating change at the organizational level, the team level, and the individual level. And then we're going to talk about maintaining the gains. So welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Hund, uh, and I direct the National Team Steps Program. Uh, and I am also Director for Clinical Quality here at the American Hospital Association. So greetings to you from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the AHA's vision really is as of a society of healthy communities where all individuals reach their highest potential for health. And so we really believe strongly that Team Steps is a way to help foster those communities and to help everybody reach those goals. So a few rules of engagement today. Uh, you can listen to the audio for this webinar two different ways. You can listen through the phone, uh, and if you do that, mute your computer speakers so you don't get a weird echoey sound, or you can listen through your computer. That's fine, too, if you have that option. We'll do a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. The way we'll do this is we'll ask you to chat in questions in the general chat box, and as you chat those questions in, if there's something that we can answer quickly and easily, or if they're more of a logistical nature, we'll take care of that and answer your question in the chat. If it's something that seems like it'd be good for the whole group to hear and it would be a good discussion question, I'll bring it back to a Q&A at the end and I will we'll ask the question of the speakers. So please, throughout, as you think of something, chat in your, your questions. Some upcoming Team Steps events, uh, we'll have master training courses uh, through September 2017. Those are all open. Uh, you can register for them. The courses are filling up, but the registration is open, so head on over and check that out. We also have uh, one uh, advanced course uh, application period open. We're accepting applications through the end of this week. So if you want to attend an advanced course, uh, and it's August 25th at Metro Health in Cleveland, Ohio, now is the time to send in your application. What that course really does is it takes the team step principles that you've learned and it combines that, it talks about how you combine them with other programs you might be involved in, focuses in particularly on high reliability, also talks a little bit more about coaching, and then really gets into uh, kind of forming a business case uh, for your organization. So it's more about sustaining and spreading team steps. As always, uh, if you have a question uh, that's not related to the current webinar we're on, uh, you could always call us at the number on the screen or email us uh, at that email address. That's the best way to get in touch with us. Okay, I'm going to be tossing it over to today's presenters in just a second. Uh, you're in for, I think, a real treat with three pros here. You have Ross Irvintrout, who's the Clinical Director of Teen Performance uh, at the WAMI Institute for Stimulation and Healthcare. Uh, you have Megan Sherman, who's the Associate Director of WISH as well as Farrah Leland, also the Associate Director of WISH. And they have been involved with Team Steps for many years. I'm thinking they've been doing training as a regional training center for seven or eight years. So you really have some great experts here. They've spoken extensively on the topic at the Team Steps National Conference, on webinars, and, and really across the country. So you're in for a treat. And I'm going to toss it over to them now, and I'll talk to you all again during Q&A. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hello, everybody from Seattle. This is um, Ross Ermintrout, and as Chris said, um, I'm the clinical director of team, team performance. I'm an RN by background and spent about 20 years at the bedside 
about 10 of that in the burn center at our regional burn center here at UW Medicine, and then uh, another 10 in the trauma intensive care unit, and have been involved in patient safety and team training for the last 10 years. And I'm going to let Farah and Megan introduce themselves real quick. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Megan Sherman, um, Associate Director for Operations for our WISH program, which is our simulation center here at University of Washington. My background is in education and human development, so I've been working very closely with this group for quite a few years in um, how best to implement team steps in um, both clinical and non-clinical settings. Hi, I'm Sarah Leland. I'm the Associate Director of WISH and for Compliance and Finance. Um, and I've been working with Team Steps and this team of people to, to teach it for our national courses for about the, since about 2009. Um, and Megan and I both come from the non-clinical um, uh, sector. All right, so just real quick about UW Medicine. We're located in Seattle, and we have four hospitals and over 200 clinics. Um, we do have the, the Level 1 Trauma Center, which uh, has obviously trauma, and then the Regional Burn Center here in the Northwest. We actually cover about 25% of the geographical area. We, uh, WAMI start, stands for Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. So we, we actually take patients from all five of those states. Um, we have 2,400 faculty members, over 4,700 4, clinical faculty, um, 4,500 students and trainees, and then around 27,000 employees in our system. And our role in what we do is to work as many people as possible to roll out team steps throughout our health system. So today what we'd like to do is talk about implementing, discuss how implementing team steps in healthcare can improve patient outcomes through better communication and teamwork, identify the, some of the team steps tools associated with the 100, 200, and 300 level concepts, and, and I'll get more to that on how we have broken these tools down into that mode, and descri describe some of the contributing factors to medical errors and how we need to improve communication and teamwork in healthcare. So if you're familiar with Team Steps at all, you've probably seen this triangle, and it kind of brings it all together where the arrows go back and forth. And our goal here is to change some performance, change our attitudes, and improve our knowledge base. And within that triangle, you'll see there's four concepts, leadership, communication, situation monitoring, and mutual support. And within each one of those concepts, there's a set of tools that helps work to um, improve your communication, teamwork, leadership, etc. Now, if you've ever seen the pocket guide, this is on the pretty much the first page of the pocket guide, the, the key principles of team steps. Again, I mentioned the communication, leadership, ship, situation monitoring, and mutual support. What I didn't mention is the team structure, and that's just the overall, how do we look at our entire team? Who's on our team? Uh, how's our team functioning, and we'll get into a little bit of that uh, today. Now, I would encourage you to go to the AHRQ website and look at the Team Steps 2.0 uh, curriculum because we're given, in about 45 minutes, we're going to give you an eight-hour course and just kind of an overview of what Team Steps is, but all of this stuff's available on the website and, and in great detail. You can pull up each one of these and it has the slides and it, it's a great resource to you, so I would encourage you to look for that. So why, why is this important? And some of you may be familiar with this report that came out well, 17 years ago, almost 18 years ago now. Um, the Institute of Medicine put this report out saying 100,000 people die or almost 100,000 people die every year from preventable medical errors and 72% of the time it's related to communication breakdown. It's not because we're putting a central line in somebody and we caused them to have a pneumothorax and maybe they died from that. That's 25 to 28% of the time. It's more likely that we're not working together as a team. Uh, we're not communicating. Somebody has a piece of information they're not sharing and w patients die because of that. But for all of us in healthcare, we know we like data that's new tomorrow. And so we're going, well, that was 18 years ago. What about now? Well, you may have seen this report, too, that came out in 14 years after that IOM report in the Journal of Patient Safety. John James is actually an engineer. He's not even a healthcare professional. He's an engineer 
whose son died because of communication breakdowns in the hospital. And he did this meta-analysis, and he came up with this estimate of 210 to 440,000 people dying every year due to preventable medical errors. So your, probably your initial response to that is, wow, we're going the wrong way. And, and that's, that might be true, but I think a part of it is we're just better at finding those adverse events that lead to these preventable medical errors. But the real issue here is 14 years later, 70% of the time it was still related to communication. So in that period of time, we made no movement whatsoever. And then just a little over a year ago in BMJ, this article came out saying we're the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. And so if you look at this article, they'll talk about, you know, IOM was underestimated, uh, John James might have overestimated, and they came up with 251,000 preventable medical errors a year leading to death. So somewhere between 100 and 440,000. And quite often when we do this, we get the skeptics in the crowd, and they go, well, what is it? Is it 100? Is it 400? Is it 250,000? What is it? And our, our response to that is, well, does it really matter? How many are okay? Are we okay with 100,000? I, I would say no especially if 70% of them are related to communication. Our goal should be we shouldn't have any communication, preventable medical errors related to communication. So, I mean, if you just put this into perspective a little bit, uh, the airline industry is a, a great example. Um, if the airline industry had this, there would be two plane crashes every single day, jumbo jets with everybody dying. I mean, you just wouldn't get on an airplane if that was the case. I think it works out to, like, 688 passengers dying every single day or uh, 28 dying every hour. That's just probably not acceptable numbers. We wouldn't accept that. You wouldn't get on an airplane, but that's what's happening in healthcare right now. And just a little bit to beat the dead horse, the Joint Commission puts these reports out, and it, I just saw the 2016 just recently came out. But every year it's the same issues. Um, human factors, communication, leadership that are the primary root causes in Sentinel events, some of those events that you have to report to the Joint Commission. Um, and you can see in 2015, communication was 79% of the time was involved in those adverse events. So we, that's even going the wrong way. If you're not familiar with human factors, uh, human factors engineering is, is basically, to simplify it, is making the, the right thing the easy thing to do or you flip that around, the wrong thing, the hard thing to do. And I, I just always like to use the, uh, the airline industry or flying on an airplane as a, as a great example of human factors engineering. When you fly on an airplane, you get up, you go to the bathroom, you walk into the bathroom, and the, you have to figure out how to turn the light on. Well, you close the door, and you go, well, how do I lock the door? Well, you, you flip the switch over, and the light comes on, too. So now you got the door locked and the, and the lights on. So that's you know, they didn't send you a PowerPoint attached to an email prior to you getting on an airplane. It's just intuitive. You figure that out. And that's kind of what we're trying to do with, uh, with health care is how do, how do we put these systems in place to make the right thing the easy thing to do? And with Team Steps, all those uh, root causes that you see there with arrows next to them, those are all things that Team Steps can help address. So what our goal is here is basically to move from a team of experts to an expert team. And I told you my background is trauma and burns, uh, you know, critical care. And I can say I think I was a, a, a really good trauma nurse and a good burn nurse, and I worked with great burn surgeons and trauma surgeons and social workers and et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't always function as an expert team, and there's a huge difference between that. And that's what we're trying to get to in Team Steps. How do we move from that team of experts to the expert team? And, you know, some great examples of that. You may remember um, back uh, several years ago where the Asiana flight landed short of the San Francisco runway. There were actually three experts in that cockpit. The, the, for the, the actual pilot had flown into that airport before but not had, flown, had not flown that type of plane in there. And the other two people in the cockpit knew that he was probably going to land short but didn't feel comfortable speaking up about that. They had a piece of information but just didn't, want, didn't feel comfortable saying anything about it. Versus the landing on the Hudson, which we're all pretty familiar with, I think. And if you ever heard Solenberger talk, he'll go, yeah, sure, I landed the plane on the river, but it required my entire team to get everybody off that plane safely. And, 
And Skiles, who was the co-pilot, was very involved. In fact, if you're not extremely familiar with that, he was actually, Skiles was flying the plane when it took off um, from the airport. They had never, he and Sonnenberger had never met each other prior to that morning. And so they were flying without knowing each other, but they immediately functioned as an expert team. And that's what's great about Team Steps. It gives you a set of tools, but there's also some concepts and how do we work better as a team as we move forward with healthcare. So here are just some of the concepts that we're going to talk about today. Um, we developed this glossary card here at the University of Washington. And any training we do, we hand this card out. It's a one-page thing, and it's a quick reference for people. The pocket guide is great. This is also good. It's just a one page. And these are the tools that we think give the biggest bang for the buck. And so we're going to, like I said, we're going to talk about, actually, we're going to talk briefly about every one of these this morning. So in the objectives, we talked about 100, 200, and 300 level skills and how to roll those out. Now, as Chris said, we've been doing this a long time, and we've been implementing it in our health system since 2009. And, and originally, we went in with an attitude that we're just going to throw out team steps to everybody. We're going to give them all the tools and figure this is the way to go. Well, then we quickly discovered that that doesn't really work that way. So we like to do it more of a systematic approach with it. Just like when you go to college, you take the 100 level course first, then the 200 and the 300 level courses. We like to start with these 100 level skills and move over to 300 level skills and once you get into those 300, you're really talking about the culture change. That's where you're going to really start seeing behaviors change. So the 100 level skills, these are really the individual ones, and we're going to start with those today. Um, in fact, if you've not heard Team Steps talk before today, once we talk about these 100 level skills, you should be able to walk away from this webinar and start practicing those immediately. Uh, you don't have to go up to somebody and say, hey, Megan, have you taken team steps yet? Because if you have, then I'm going to use some of these closed-loop communication tools on you. No, you don't have to do that. You can just pull these out of people, and you can, and you can role model them immediately. So let's start with those 100-level skills. So communication. Uh, you know, this is basically what we were taught in kindergarten and first grade, and then it just kind of got beat out of us over the years, and now we're just trying to reinsert that into how we do in healthcare. Again, going back to the landing on the Hudson, if, if you've listened to that recording or you saw the movie or um, whatever, you'll hear them in that cockpit repeating back everything they do, back and forth. They, they just have this calm communication going. And, and that's because that's normal behavior for them. And that's where we want to go in healthcare. It would feel abnormal for that industry not to do some of these tools that we're going to talk about here. So we know effective communication must be complete, must be clear, brief, and timely. And, and it's interesting. We think what one might be clear to one person is not necessarily clear to another. And I told you I have a background in patient safety. I was the patient safety officer at Harborview Medical Center, which is one of, where our trauma center is. And I was patient safety officer there for about 10 years. And towards the end of that role, I was looking at um, – uh, reviewing charts. I had to review charts quite a bit. And towards the end, I was starting to see texting abbreviations in the charts, things like the letter B and the number 4 for B4. And, you know, it's, that's not really an acceptable abbreviation. Or, or it, it, I, I often will say, you know, I was just waiting for LOL to show up, and, and I was doing this a couple months ago with our team, and somebody in the audience said, oh, I saw LOL, LOL in the chart. And I said, really? And what she said is it stands for little old lady. Those are not acceptable abbreviations. So we need to make sure we're all on the same page with those. So a set of tools that comes from Team Steps is called closed loop communication. Now I'm going to give a little disclaimer here because if you go to the curriculum website or the HRQ website for the curriculum, they're going to have two of the four tools that we have used in our system. We've, we've introduced two other tools within the UW Health System, and I'm going to talk about all four of those. So first of all, the request or the call out. That's just making the request, having that order, uh, getting somebody to do something that needs to be done. And what we like to talk about is generally in healthcare, 
uh, again, going back to my background, and we'd get in a crisis situation and somebody, the, maybe the so-called leader would say, I need somebody to get me a blood gas. Well, it's, we, here, we live in King County, we call that the King County request. Who's getting the blood gas? No, you know, three people may set up to get the blood gas or nobody gets set up to get the blood gas. So we like to say when you make a request, if you know the person's name, call them by name. Megan, will you please get me a blood gas? If you don't know people's names with big health systems, that's highly possible that you don't know everybody's name. You point, you make eye contact, and you say, will you please get me a blood gas? Simple as that doesn't add any time, and in fact, in the long run, it might save you time. And I'll give you an example at the end in our health system where it would have made a huge difference to use this closed-loop communication. The second part of that is call-out. Call-out is just unsolicited information that helps get everybody back on the same page. Uh, you're in a room, patient's maybe not doing so well, the leader's focused on one thing, and you see that the patient's saturations are dropping. You might just say, hey, leader, saturations are down to 90%. Hey, leader, saturations are down to 85%. Kind of get their attention. Again, you notice I called out leader. I'd call them out by name. I'd say if the person intubating, if it's, if it's Farah trying to intubate this patient, I'm going to say, hey, Farah, stats are 80%. Do you want to stop trying to intubate? Let's reoxygenate and move on from and figure out what our next steps are there. So call out unsolicited information helps get everybody back on the same page. The next one, and again, this request and cross-check are two that we've introduced into the um, curriculum ourselves here at UW. Cross-check is just repeating back what I've just asked you to do. I'll say, hey, Megan, will you please get me a blood gas? Yes, Ross, I will get your blood gas. So simple as that, just repeating back what I said. And you start thinking about that. Blood gas is not a big, well, it is a big deal, but what if it's a medication? and I give Megan a, an order for a medication that's the wrong dose, and she repeats it back to me, now we both go, oh, wait, that's not the right dose. You know, if I say uh, give 20 milligrams of methogen, she's probably going to say, you want me to give 20 milligrams of methogen? Because that's probably not the right dose. So work from there. So that's cross-check, just repeating back what you heard. Again, if you listen to the landing on the Hudson, uh, black box recording or watch the movie, they're repeating back. They're 100 feet from landing on the river, and Sullenberger says flaps out, and Skiles repeats flaps out. So it's just part of their nature, and that's where we want to go with healthcare. And then finally, the check back is just closing that loop. I asked Megan to get me a blood gas. She says, Ross, I'll get you your blood gas. She comes back a few minutes later and said, Ross, the blood gas is completed closing that loop. Now I know that task is done. Or even maybe even more important, she comes back and says, Ross, I wasn't able to get the blood gas. Now I know I have to reassign that role. So it seems pretty basic, this stuff. And, and when every group we work with, this is just something we, we think you're, you're going to start doing right now. It, as soon as you walk out of this room, we ask people to take this, own, own these closed loop communication tools from the beginning, because they are individual tools. And, and they make a difference. And an example of that within our own, oh, well, I forgot we had this Starbucks picture in here. We see this every day in Seattle. You know, if, if, you're any, if you ever come to Seattle, you'll realize that our Starbucks stores are about 20 feet apart from each other. I think it's kind of a law in this state that you have to have them next to each other. So we can't, you know, we can't go six minutes without a cup of coffee here. And you walk in and you order Vente non or Fibonella Misto, and the person at the counter repeats it back to you, says it to the barista who repeats it back to them, and then they put it on the counter and they say Vente non or Fibonella Misto. They train their people to do that, closed-loop communication, because when stores, if every store in Seattle, just Seattle alone, if every Starbucks store in Seattle had 10 wrong drinks a day, they would go broke, because if they give you a wrong drink, then they either give you another free one or a coupon for later. They, they wouldn't be able to afford that. So we like to look at maybe as insulin and heparin and some of the things we do in healthcare might be as important as the morning coffee at Starbucks. So, but this happened in our system and this is really the impetus to really push for team communication and really why I'm in the job I'm in now as the clinical director for team performance. This is McKinsey Bryant. And this is a picture of her when she was about four years old. When she was an infant, 
she had a heart transplant in our health system and was doing very, very well and uh, developed a cold when she was four, uh, some sort of virus. Mom took her to a pediatrician. She wasn't getting better, so the mom called into um, the emergency department and talked to the cardiac fellow who had, was um, working for the attending who had done McKinsey's transplant. So he, he talked to the mom on the phone, said, let me call the attending and I'll get back to you. And, and he talked to the attending, the attending said, you know, give her this and this and this, but don't give her Afrin. And the fellow just responded by, okay, got it. Didn't do any kind of closed loop communication. Just said, okay, got it, something along those lines. And called the mom back and said, go, I've called in some scripts to the local pharmacy. Um, go ahead and pick that up and then pick her up some Afrin and go ahead and give her the Afrin. And so the mom did and gave her the Afrin right at the store. Uh, and on the way home, the child went into cardiac arrest. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. You can read more about McKinsey Bryant. Um, you can just Google it, and it'll talk about how the mom was trying to figure out how to do chest compressions on her own daughter, um, which is it's, it's quite a, a devastating story. Now, if that fellow had responded to that attending saying, okay, you want me to give this, this, and this, and give her Afrin, that would have given the attending an opportunity to say, no, don't give her Afrin. Simple closed-loop communication. Now, McKinsey survived, but she's severely disabled now, requires 24 hours a day, seven days a week care. And this was a huge settlement in our health system. It was over $15 million, but that's not really the issue. Simple closed loop communication would have made the difference in this, this child's care. Now lots of times we hear, well, we're, we're implementing a new EMR and we're implementing uh, this consulting company coming in. We have all these other things going on and now Ross and Farron and Megan want us to do team steps too. No, Team Steps is not an additional thing. It's integrated into what you already do. And, and that's really important to remember. Um, you can't tell me that closed loop communication takes any time. In fact, if you look at McKinsey's case, it would have saved everybody a lot of time, including McKinsey herself. So um, think about that as you try to roll this out. Integrate it into what you already do. And then the last communication tool I want to talk about real quickly is, is SBAR. And SBAR, probably, if you'd never heard of Team Steps before, you probably heard of SBAR. Um, and it stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. And, and most people will put ISBAR. I just introduce yourself to the person you're talking to if you don't know them, or especially if you're on the phone. And it's just a quick way to convey information. It can be in a crisis situation or, or a non-crisis situation. And situation is basically a one sentence, what's going on right now with the patient? What's the background related to that situation? I don't need to know the entire history of this patient at this point. I just need to know the background related to that situation. Um, situation might be patient's an unstable SVT. Um, the background is he came in last night for a rule out MI. My assessment is its heart rates. 170 and his blood pressure is 75 over 40 and then I go into the recommendation. The recommendation is you probably need to get here and see this patient right now. We should consider cardioverting this patient. So I went through that one sentence each and I could do it in just a few seconds. They didn't need to know on the background that the patient was diabetic, not related to the situation. So that's the key to SBAR. And you notice when I did it, I said the words. I said situation, background, assessment, recommendation. We when we work with people, we make them say the words because it helps keep you focused. Here's just an example of uh, one we did with our neonatal ICU here at the University of Washington. Hi, Dr. Wilson, this is Ann, so that's the introduction. I'm calling about baby girl dish here. The situation is she's having a lot of ABD events that are now requiring stimulation. Background is she is 29 weeks corrected and was the baby that you evaluated earlier for increased apnea and bradycardia events. My assessment is she's still on room air, but her color doesn't look right. I think she's getting sicker, and that she may be getting, sorry about that, she may be getting sicker. I recommend we do an evaluation and maybe some labs right now. So I got through it very quickly, uh, didn't have any of that extraneous stuff that nobody really cares about. And SBAR is a great tool. Uh, what we find is the physicians love it, nurse practitioners, PAs, they love it when, when especially nurses and, and MD back and forth discussions go in SBAR.
but we use it in all areas, including the non-clinical areas where we, we teach uh, receptionists in the clinics to use it, et cetera. Now I'm going to hand this off to Megan for yeah. handoffs. So Ross talked a little bit about SBAR, and let's keep that in mind as we talk about handoff. And handoff being itself is the critical time, whether it's during a shift change, um, a transfer of patient between floors or units, these transitions in care between providers really pose um, kind of a natural risk that not all information would be shared completely. And so having a handoff strategy in place, um, it's a way that kind of designs or enhances the exchange of information to include um, opportunity to ask questions, clarify that the information was heard correctly, and just kind of confirm that everybody's on the same page. Um, moving, can you this slide for me? Um, I pass the baton is one of several options for handoff. It's an acronym, and it's kind of a lengthy one. Um, it incorporates some of the same elements as SBAR. Really what it gets to, it uh, starts with I, or introduction, um, goes through patient um, identifiers about the patient, your assessment of what's going on, the situation, safety concerns, and then gets into a little bit of the background, actions, timing, ownership, and then what you um, think needs to happen next. Um, additionally, uh, there are some other examples of handoff tools, Anticipate, iPath, and Shark. Um, it really depends on your organization and what's going to work best for you. At the University of Washington, iPath is kind of a recent addition to our practice. It's based on a 2014 article um, by Starmer and some colleagues that comes out of Boston's Children's Hospital. It's an article that's published in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, and we've uh, used this quite successfully with some of our residents and in our burn center. It's a little bit shorter of an acronym, but um, it presents some of the same information that you need to make sure is um, kind of transferred during this handoff process. It gets to illness severity, patient summary, action list for the new team, situational awareness, and synthesis and reading, reading back of the information that closed loop communication comes into play with iPath. Um, when we're talking about situation monitoring, uh, STEP is a situation monitoring tool, and the concept of situation monitoring, uh, for those who may be less aware, is really this idea of knowing what's going on with you and in your environment. And STEP is a great tool for this. It kind of helps you work through uh, situational awareness, uh, what you need to be aware of at any given time. It starts with uh, status of the patient. Hang on. Ross is flipping for me here. So uh, status of the patient, which uh, discusses patient history, vital signs, medication, physical exams, plan of care, or um, any psychosocial conditions that may be going on at the time. Uh, it then goes into this uh, discussion of team members, what's going on with your team and the environment. This is things, and uh, we'll talk about if you can flip forward one, Ross. The I'm Safe checklist is really a way to identify both yourself and your team members what's going on. Are, does illness come into play? Is anybody on the team on some sort of medication? Um, what stress is coming into play? Really being aware of what your team is going through. The players, um, is everybody available and present at the time? Go back to the team. Sorry. Um, and then understanding things like what workload. Is everybody kind of swamped and they don't have the ability to take on new tasks or new information? Recognizing those things and what's going on with your team is really going to be important in maintaining the situational awareness. Um, the E step is uh, knowing what's going on in your environment. And this is things like um, knowing your resources, what's available. Uh, we had an example um, when we rolled out some new uh, clinic simulations at our Ballard Clinic recently, where in the process of this simulation, we were able to test kind of the uh, facility itself and it became very clear that none of the providers knew where the AED was located. And so being aware of those types of things and being able to correct for and anticipate uh, really helps you maintain that kind of shared mental model of what needs to happen. And finally, the last step on the step checklist is the progression towards the goal. We're going to talk about huddles and briefs in a little bit, but really this is um, an opportunity to really assess are we making progress towards what we've identified is the key goal? Or as new information comes in, do we need to reassess or reevaluate as a team and um, kind of huddle back together and really discuss that plan and maybe come up with a new plan if it's important uh, enough to do so? 
So we talked about uh, situational awareness, and that's essentially that's an individualized skill. And uh, what can happen, you can know everything that's going on in your environment. However, unless you're sharing that information with your team members, even if you think it's something that is completely um, obvious to someone else, you may not always be on the same page. So this is an exercise that we go through. Uh, we've circled the one in the lower corner. Can uh, anybody type into that box and tell me what they see in the chat box? You people are typing. A rabbit and a duck. Duck, duck, rabbit. duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit. Everybody sees the rabbit. Or the, can everybody? Hopefully, everybody can see the rabbit, and everybody can see the duck. These are a little hard to do over a webinar. Uh, the next one that we have, uh, can folks tell me what they see there? Young lady, young lady, and old lady. Young lady. This is a more difficult one, and this is one we make fun of Ross quite a bit for because it took him about two years to find the old woman, and every once in a while we'll have to show him again. There is a pointer function on here. Let me see if I can show uh, where it's located. So for those of you that can see my pointer here, the young woman, this is her eye, her nose, her chin. This is her neck. She's wearing a little necklace. This is an ear over here. For the old woman, this is a big nose, a big chin, a mouth, an eye. She's looking down in this direction. If you move up to the upper corner, uh, we see a face or two vases. And moving on, um, oops, we clicked with printer or the pointer again. Uh, we see a, a young woman's face and a saxophone player. So one of the reasons we show these, and it's often uh, beneficial when you're in a large group setting to show those that you're training and team steps, is this idea that uh, what you see going on may not be a shared mental model of what's going on with the rest of the room. Just because I see a duck or I'm um, making my plans around this information that I see and I think is obvious to everybody in the room does not necessarily mean that Sarah or Ross see the same thing. They may be seeing a bunny in this situation. And so it's really important to share that, those critical pieces of information uh, with your team, even no matter how obvious you think it may be, just so everybody's on that same page and you have a shared mental model. So how do we get to a shared mental model? Uh, really, was, we're talking about the how comes through closed loop communication, these ideas of call out, cross check, check that. SBAR or even the IPASS, the baton or IPASS tools um, are great ways to share those critical pieces of information. And they can be shared during briefs, huddles, debriefs, or any time during handoffs or transitions in care. So we haven't talked about briefs, huddles, and debriefs yet. I want to uh, have people think of these. When we teach them, we try to tell people to think of this as happening at the beginning, middle, and end of a situation. That brief is your short planning session prior to the start. That's where you're setting your roles. You're clarifying everybody's responsibilities. You are anticipating what's going to happen and establishing your goals or expectations. Um, the huddle happens in the middle of an event when perhaps new information comes in or uh, the plan isn't going as one would have anticipated. And it's really that ad hoc session where everybody kind of reconvenes, comes back together, um, spends maybe five, ten seconds reestablishing what the goal is and uh, making plans to move forward from there. And then the debrief is a, um, just as important. It's that information exchange after the action. A lot of people think of debriefs as happening only after events where something went wrong. We would like to encourage people to do briefs, huddles, debriefs, all three of these skills um, as much as possible because there's always something to be learned uh, in an exchange when something went very well that you want to replicate, but also uh, in events where perhaps things didn't go as well and you need to figure out ways to make plans for the future. I'm going to transfer it now to Ross, who's going to, I think, wrap up here and talk a little bit about mutual support. Yeah, I just wanted, and we'll talk about this more in subsequent in the, the following um, webinars next month and the month after that. But like brief is a tool that we really push people to try to do at the beginning of rounds, beginning of a shift, or whatever. Our, our operating room at Harborview Medical Center, again, the trauma center, 20, I think there's 26 ORs there every morning they do a brief in every single OR for the whole day for that OR. So there's 25 or 26 different briefs going on every morning. It's taking them about three minutes, and what they're finding is making the day much more efficient. And um, that's just a little teaser for a few of our, our next two webinars, um, how those have made a huge difference on 
making patient care more efficient as well as staff being satisfied with how things are run in that operating room. So finally, the last set of tools, and now we're really into the 300-level tools, the, the, the conflict uh, tools, um, interpersonal conflict, as well as informational conflict. And Team Steps has tools for both of these. Uh, when Team Steps first came out, we really focused on, uh, you, some of you might remember this, SBAR and CUS, and everybody thought if they taught every single nurse in the United States and the world in hospitals how to do SBAR and CUS, that everything would be great. And what we found is it didn't really, um, it didn't really work because, first of all, we didn't teach anybody else. We just taught nurses. And it's, it's more than just teaching somebody the tools. It's about getting that culture change to happen. And, and I know there's some questions following that closed loop, and we'll, we'll get into those. Um, I kind of want to get through this, and then we'll talk about those, too. But um, so the, the conflict, there, first of all, there's informational conflict, and that's just you and I are taking care of a patient, and there's an issue with I, I'm not on the same page as what you are on the same page. And somehow we need to get to that same page. Megan talked about the shared mental model. How do we get there? And I might just have a question about what's, what we're doing moving forward with this patient. And that's, those tools are two challenge rule and cuss, and I'm going to get into those. And then the other one is interpersonal conflict. That's just you and I aren't getting along for whatever reason. You yelled at me in front of, somebody, in front of a patient, in front of other staff members, and we need to deal with that. We're going to spend very little time on Descript today, but again, I would encourage you to go to the website curriculum to see more about that. So here is the Descript. And really that informational conflict, if I were to go back to that previous slide, that informational conflict can actually turn into interpersonal conflict if we don't deal with it early on. But death grip is just a, a constructive approach to managing and trying to resolve that conflict. Not necessarily in the moment. You may have to get through whatever's going on and then address this later. So you really make it more I statements. You know, describe the situ specific situation. Um, I noticed that you got angry at me um, when, when I put in the Foley in this patient. Um, I'm concerned about how you address that in front of three other staff people. It, it made me feel pretty bad. See, it's all, I, I'm bringing it back to me versus you. Um, in, the, in the future, if you have an issue with how I do things, can you please maybe just pull me aside and we can discuss it? And, and the consequence is, you know, we're going to have to take this to the next level if we can't agree on, some, uh, on our alternatives that we just discussed. So it's just a quick way. Obviously, this is not going to take care of the kind of inter interpersonal conflict where Megan and I might just hate each other. That's more than death grip is going to deal with. But it's better for that in-the-moment discussion on how do we move forward to get the best outcomes for patient care. And that's really the key about all this team step stuff. It's about the patient. It's not about you and me. This is all about improving patient outcomes. And then the last tool we want to talk about is CUS. Again, this is, if you've heard of Team Steps before, you've probably heard of this, and people will say, well, let's just teach people cuss and everybody will be fine. But it doesn't really work that way. So it's, um, I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable, this is a safety issue. That's what CUS stands for. Uh, I walk into a room, a few people are looking at an EKG on a patient that's not doing so well, and I hear the attending physician say, uh, I think this is second degree heart block. Well. Maybe I just took my EKG course and I see that, and I, I'm thinking it might be third-degree heart block, which is a huge difference between the two. So I might say, hey, doctor, I'm concerned that this is third-degree heart block instead of second-degree heart block. I'm uncomfortable that if we don't do something quickly to treat this third-degree heart block, it's going to become a safety issue for this patient. So I went through those very quickly, and you notice how I said I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable. Again, it's using I statements versus, holy smokes, Farrah, what are you thinking? Uh, quite often in healthcare, that's what we do. Oh, God, you're so far off base here. And now I've shut down those lines of communication. Cuss is a way to state my concerns, and it's an opportunity to stop the line to make sure we're all going down the, the, the right path. Now, it doesn't mean I'm right. It just means I have a concern and somebody needs to address that concern with me and then we can get back on the same page. So we talked about 
the 100 level skills, 200 level skills, and 300 level skills. Now I know there was a question earlier about how do you, um, I can't remember exactly how, how, how you stated it, but when you have contract people coming in, agency and travelers people, people coming in, in and out, some of these tools it doesn't matter. You start changing the culture by, especially the 100 level skills. If, if I'm working with a group, um, and we practice this right in our own simulation center here, if, if I ask, make a request to somebody and they go, okay, got it, or they go, nod their head and start walking away, I'm going to say, hey, Farah, can you just cross-check that with me? Can you repeat back with me what I just asked you to do? They don't even know I'm doing team steps to them, but I'm using my leadership skills, my team step skills to pull that out of them. So those 100-level skills, it doesn't matter if somebody walks into your unit on any given day, you can pull those out of them. I mean, my teammanship skills would just be to do the cross-check. But if people don't, I ask them to do it for me. Same thing, you know, I'll say, can you, can you just let me know when that blood gas is done? So now I've, we ask them to close that loop with me, do that check back with me after the request has been done. Same thing with SBAR. Somebody comes up and they start rambling, you can say, hey, Megan, just wait a minute. What's the situation right now? And Megan tells me the situation. I go, okay, what's the background related to this situation? Again, Megan doesn't know I'm even doing team steps to her. Those are the kind of ways you start changing the culture when people get in the habit of doing that. We just got, I just got an email from somebody that was saying how she used, they had a crazy night in the ICU a couple weeks ago, or a couple nights ago, and they had multiple codes going on and multiple rapid responses, and she had just been through the course, and she goes, I was just doing that all night long, and people were really appreciative of it. So, Sure, you get a little eye rolling at first because it seems so basic, but if it's good enough for the nuclear industry and the airline industry, I think it's probably good enough for us. You know, briefs, people, they just have to show up to those. As you get into cussing to challenge, those, those again are a culture change, but if you start working systematically through these tools, that culture change starts to happen. And a lot of places we work with, they want to do cuss right, right off the bat. And you can do that, but then you have to introduce briefs every day too. And if some, during that brief, that two or three minute brief, somebody at the end of it says, we like to say somebody with you know, a little bit of power, maybe the attending physician or the nurse manager or the charge nurse who looks at everybody else on the team and says, you know, if you have a concern about something going on with patient care, I want you to cuss. That's where you start changing the culture. So it's a great tool, but you really have to kind of systematically work through these tools we found, at least in our health system, to make them most effective. So within, again, this is something you'll find on the curriculum website. Um, all of these tools, there, there's lots of barriers to teamwork and communication, but there's also a lot of tools and strategies that you can use to do this. We didn't talk about all of them. We got through um, some of the ones. Again, we think the biggest bang for our buck are the ones we talked about today and that's the ones we push in our 60 minutes, our 90 minutes, our four-hour sessions, we really push this. We also use a lot, lots of low-tech simulation. If you've ever seen us present, we use Legos, actually, that can be used with non-clinical and clinical people together um, to improve uh, their teamwork. And uh, obviously our outcomes is to get a better shared mental model, some better teamwork, and ultimately it's all about the patient and patient safety. So with that, Ross, can you go back? Oh, yeah, to, we sure. had a question. Can you clarify the two challenge? Can you, the oh, sorry. Yeah. So the two challenge rule is, and, and everybody defines this a little bit different. But if I were to go in and I was to cuss at somebody, and and I don't get any response, it's pretty much my responsibility to do it again. And uh, so. Let me, let me back up a little bit on that. Um, that's a great question. So on CUS, places that have done it really well, all they have to do is say, I'm concerned, and that's enough to stop the line. You know, I'll say, hey, Megan, I'm concerned, and Megan will go, oh, okay, let's stop a minute. Ross has a concern. I'm, I'm getting cussed at. The two challenge rule would just be doing it twice. And again, those places that have done it well, I'm concerned is the first challenge. I'm uncomfortable is the second challenge. That's one way to present it. The other way is I state a concern about something, I go all the way through cuss, I get no response. Again, it's my responsibility to do it again. And if I still get no response, 
then it's my responsibility to, to take the next step. And, and in the curriculum, they talk about going up the chain of command, which is great. But if you're working night shift at 2 a.m., your chain of command may not be much more than the team that you're working with that night. And so we say open it up to your team. If Grab a team member, a fellow nurse, a fellow resident, a fellow social worker, whoever it is, and say, hey, here's my concern. Do you think this is a concern too? Now let's go to and try to address this quick again. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of CUS. We don't spend a lot of energy on the, on the two challenge rule, but, but it's there for a reason. Um, every hospital in the world has a policy that says you must go up the chain of command if, if you have a concern. But the reality is policies don't change culture. Behaviors change culture, and that's what we're looking at. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, okay, so there are the tools. Again, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that, folks. So with that, we'd like to um, open it up to any questions. And, uh, and I know Chris and Farah have been looking, so uh, we might have missed some on the way. So we're happy to address those, too. Hi, guys. Thank you. This is Chris, uh, Ross, Megan, and Farah. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was really great. And we did get a lot of good questions coming through. And, and Farah, thank you for answering those as, as we went. Um, I think that there was a couple things that we went through that I wouldn't mind clarifying on a little bit. We, we had talked for a second uh, there about, you know, getting to a shared mental model and, you know, how you do that. And I wanted to take a step back and think, what do you do if you run into a situation where somebody doesn't have a shared mental model when you cuss at that? So let's say I cuss at you, Ross, and, and you're thinking, no, you know, your concern is misplaced or we do a closed loop communication and I, I totally, you know, am going the wrong direction when I check back with you. So what do you do in those situations? So, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and I noticed somebody had typed something in, not too different from where that question was leading. Um, right. First of all, back in the day when we decided to teach every nurse cuss, and when I say we, I'm talking the general we, um, I wasn't really involved in Team Steps back then. That was in like, probably about 2006 or seven when this idea came out um, to do SBAR and CUS. If you start just giving somebody a tool and say, here's your tool, and then expect them to go out and talk to other people in, in the other healthcare professions, physicians, pharmacists, nurses, um, social work, MAs, what, respiratory therapists, whatever, they kind of have to have an understanding of what you're doing a little bit. And you have to start developing that, that open uh, lines of communication. So what, one of the things we talk about, too, that I didn't say with CUSS is every group we work with, we say CUSS is a great tool, but what you also have to do is ask yourself how, what kind of culture have I established around myself to be acceptable of somebody cussing at me? <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have to start building that, and that's why we say it's a 300-level skill. It's it's a lot easier said than done. But every group, and all all our sessions now are interprofessional. We ask everybody to think in, internally. How do you respond to somebody questioning you in a in the case of patient safety? So that's question one. Two, if you keep going back to those I statements and open it up with a line of communication that's not about how you're functioning but how I'm concerned about it, you're more likely to get a positive response. And the third thing is really to change this culture too is when somebody does cuss at you, whether they're right or wrong, you know, as, as the example I gave was second and third degree heart block, you know, that attending physician would look at it and say, you know, here's why I think it's second degree heart block, Ross. Look at the rest of the team. Team, what do you think? Obviously, it's not a diplomatic vote. You don't vote third or second degree heart block, but you, you get an agreement. Team agrees it's second degree heart block. Now, that attending physician has two choices. They can look at me and say, hey, Ross, you're the new guy here. Next time, just keep your mouth shut, which means I will, not, I will probably not speak up next time. Or they can say, well, thanks for bringing that up because 
that's an important thing. And next time, you might be right, and we have to make sure people feel comfortable speaking up. So thanking somebody after they cuss at you really starts changing that culture as well. So, <clears throat> you know, it's not just all, you know, all roses coming up here that when people use cuss that everybody goes, oh, okay, it's, everything's good. It's starting to change that culture, and as more and more people hear about it, it makes sense. And, and we have people in our system that I thought would never convert, been around for 35 years, and some of them, they're, they're our biggest champions now, our, our, our chief of trauma here at, at, at UW Harborview Medical Center is just great about it now, and he was probably one of the hardest ones to put a concern to ever in the past. So it's a slow culture change. It doesn't happen overnight. Thanks, Ross. Uh, yeah, there's definitely, I think your discussion really sparked a lot of uh, questions, and a lot of the questions coming in here are around uh, things with how do you engage physicians? How do you get leaders to, you know, really take ownership of the situation? What are you doing to kind of, you know, assess your culture? And I think those are a lot of things. This is a good commercial for the next webinar that Farah just texted in up there, uh, which is going to be using team steps to create change at the organizational team and individual level. And so uh, to everybody listening, Ross, Megan, and Farah will also be presenting on that webinar as well as a third webinar in a series that is going to be about maintaining the gain. So that's all about sustainability and then also, you know, how it's evolving. So definitely something there that I think everybody, you know, love for you to join us for that too, uh, for those next two webinars. In, uh, and, and also we had put a link up there for the evidence base that's available on the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality website that has a lot of great links to articles all about different things with team steps, individual tools that are part of the team steps program or team training in general and, you know, just different evidences and, and things there about uh, why this works and how this works. Um, so we are going to be sending out right after this uh, an evaluation link. So we'd love if everybody can go ahead and, and do the evaluations. I'd like to thank, again, Ross, Megan, Farah, and uh, everybody else that is on the UW WISH team that I know is a part of the Regional Training Center program for all the support and for everything today. So, so thanks to the three of you. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, this is Chris Hunt from the American Hospital Association. Looking forward to hearing from you next time. So have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect your lines, log off the webinar. Have a great afternoon.